Since the October 7th attack, Israel's leaders have invoked the historical persecution of the Jewish people to justify Israel's ongoing siege of Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called Hamas's massacre, quote, the worst act of anti-Semitic violence since the Holocaust, and said that just as the world united to defeat the Nazis, it must also stand united behind Israel to defeat Hamas. But as the death toll in Gaza continues to rise and some experts warn of a potential genocide, critics have started questioning this framing. Are Jewish history and anti-Semitism being weaponized, as some within the Jewish community claim? That discussion is coming up in an Upfront Special. Joining us to discuss this is Omer Bartov, an Israeli-American professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University, Stephanie Fox, executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace, and Omar Bedar, political analyst and commentator and former deputy director of the Arab American Institute. Thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, Omar, I'm going to start with you. Uh, following Hamas's attack, uh, both Israeli and Western officials have repeatedly invoked Israel's right to defend itself. U.S. President Biden's anti-Semitism envoy, Deborah Lipstadt, went further, saying, quote, no one has the right to tell Israel how to defend itself. But Israel's response has had devastating humanitarian consequences. States have the right to defend themselves within the limits of international law, uh, but they also have to consider proportionality. Uh, where is the line between Israel's right to defense and the toll that it's taking on the Palestinian people? Mark, I'll take it a step back and say even before we get to the question of proportionality, is to remember that Israel is an occupying force in Gaza. Gaza has been placed under siege by Israel for more than 17 years, in which life in Gaza is miserable. People, there was no economy to speak of. Half the population is unemployed. Um, most of the water that is in Gaza is undrinkable, and they don't have the right to have an airport or a seaport or trade with the outside world. That is the reality for Gaza. And successive Israeli military operations in Gaza have killed literally thousands of innocent people, including hundreds of children. More than 300 children in 2008 and 9, more than 550 children in 2014. And so when we ask the question of the right to self-defense, the most obvious question that should come up is, do Palestinians have the right to self-defense? And as an occupied people who are living under a brutal military occupation, there is no question that they do. But obviously, nobody thinks that Hamas's attack, which included tremendous harm to Israeli civilians, that anybody could consider that to be an act of self-defense. Similarly... Let me ask you a question about that, because there are people, particularly is Israeli advocates, who would say, fine, the West Bank is occupied, but Israel moved all the troops. The settlers left in 2006. Uh, this is Hamas's issue. If there's if there's violence in Gaza, if there's a problem in Gaza, it's not Israel's occupation. It, it's it, it's it's Hamas. What do you say to those people? Look, ending an occupation of a place does not just mean taking settlers out. Because Israel is literally in control of everything that goes in, in and out of the Gaza Strip, because they're not allowed to function or have access to the outside world without Israeli permission, nothing goes into Gaza without Israel's permission. Nothing leaves Gaza without Israel's permission. And again, there is. You know, if, if, it's, if you're talking about Israel controlling its own border or Egypt controlling its own border, that's one thing. But when you say Gaza is not allowed to have an airport and Gaza is not allowed to have a seaport, that the last time a humanitarian ship tried to come into Gaza to deliver some aid, Israeli soldiers boarded that ship and killed nine people on board, including an American citizen, you can't pretend that Gaza is a free place that is up for the people who live in it uh, to determine its future because it is under occupation. And that's the reason why the U.N., and many other human rights organizations also consider Gaza to continue to be under Israeli occupation. Stephanie, let me bring you in here. Many have pointed out that October 7th was the most lethal attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust, one which, as the writer uh, Adam Schatz put it, triggered the rawest part of Jews' psyche, the fear of annihilation. Can you help us understand the psychological impact of Hamas's attack? Listen, every single one of the 1,200 Israelis murdered by Hamas, that over 200 kidnapped, are precious and sacred, you know, on a human level. And as a Jew with loved ones directly harmed, I, of course, understand the desire to feel like the clock has to stop, to feel engulfed with the pain and horror of what are obvious atrocities and war crimes. But I think that um, when you speak about that sort of sense of triggering a, a core and sort of primal Jewish fear of annihilation, um, 
that's not um, a new dynamic for us to be talking about in the context of the Israeli government or its oppression of Palestinians, right? We have to understand the ways in which um, the Israeli government from its outset has been set on abusing the history of Jewish suffering and using it to justify more and more oppression and dispossession of Palestinians. And we've been taught as Jews that Palestinians are somehow the rightful inheritors of the blame for genocidal European Christian anti-Semitism in the Holocaust, while never deemed worthy of their own, and that the basic fundamental longing Palestinians have for freedom in their own homes, for survival in their own indigenous lands, is falsely represented as rooted in hatred for Jews instead of love for family, love for community, love for the land to which they belong, you know? And so I think that in this moment, we see entwining and intertwining of Jewish trauma and Palestinian trauma that we have to start um, understanding both the way that that history has been twined and intertwined, the way it's been pitted against each other, and our responsibility to look at both the Nakba and the European responsibility for the Holocaust at once. Omer, you're an expert on uh, genocide, and you have talked about uh, your concerns regarding the response of Israeli leadership to October 7th. Uh, you said that they're showing, quote, genocidal intent which can easily tip into genocidal action. You pointed to the fact that on October 28th, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, quote, you must remember what Amalek did to you. This, of course, is a reference to a Torah passage uh, where after a surprise attack, God commands the Jewish people to kill every man, woman, and infant. That's a story where failing to eradicate the enemy nearly leads to a Jewish genocide. That is to say the least provocative rhetoric. What do you make of it? What concerns you about it? Um, let, me, let me start just by saying that the Hamas attack on October 7th uh, was a horrendous attack that could easily uh, be defined as a, a crime against humanity and as a war crime. Um, and the question you asked earlier about uh, self-defense, I think, Every state uh, has a right and often a duty for self-defense. So the, the question is obviously the framing of it, as Omar said, but um, the, there is actually an issue of uh, a major attack in which uh, over 900 civilians were killed as well as 300 soldiers, often in atrocious ways. So that is one part that, that we have to keep in mind. And the sense of insecurity that is it has instilled in the entire community in Israel. And the rhetoric that has come from Israeli political leaders, you've you've mentioned Netanyahu, the, the many others, as well as some uh, military leaders, uh, has echoes of genocide. It, it, it actually sounds like an intent to carry out genocide. Now, the question is whether they're actually doing it. And my, we can go into greater detail. My, my sense is that there is huge disproportionality between the military goals that Israel wants to achieve, which is to destroy at least the military infrastructure of Hamas and the number of civilians that it has killed, including, uh, it seems, thousands of children. So on a far larger scale than ever before. Uh, so there's indication of war crimes. There's indication of crimes against humanity. Whether there is a um, genocide, I think we have not reached that point. But one thing has to be pointed out is that Israel has uh, forcibly evacuated about a million Palestinian citizens from the northern Gaza Strip to the southern Gaza Strip. It claims to do that uh, to protect them from military action, but the result is that you have now huge congestion of people without appropriate infrastructure, uh, just as winter is setting in. Uh, that can be seen as ethnic cleansing, which often in the past, in several cases of ethnic cleansing, has actually led to genocide. So this is what we have to watch out for uh, and warn against, and that's what I've been trying to do. For me as a Jew, and I think for many of us, the dehumanization of the language and the actions and the idea that 
Nearly 5,000 Palestinian children have been murdered in a month. Many more hundreds, maybe thousands, stuck under the rubble, dying slowly, while those who are dropping the bombs are talking about how these are human animals. That is like, at, talk about triggering a core Jewish understanding of what is what is the purpose of deeply dehumanizing language. Um, so many of us in the Jewish community who had take the exact opposite lesson from histories of oppression are pouring into the movement, demanding a ceasefire, demanding an end to the root causes of all of this violence, um, because we feel absolutely compelled to say, you know, never again is right now. Since October 7th, Israel said, we're trying to get rid of Hamas fully. But an internal government document uncovered by a Hebrew outlet shows that as early as October 13th, the Israeli government was already considering expelling Gaza's population into the Sinai Desert, saying that doing so would yield, quote, long-term strategic outcomes for Israel. One Israeli think tank said that following October 7th, there was, quote, a unique and rare opportunity to evacuate the entire Gaza Strip. What do the past six weeks tell us about Israel's actual motivations here? Look, there is no question that the fantasy in Israeli politicians' minds is to drive all Palestinians out of Gaza. They've always looked at Gaza as a problem that they don't know how to deal with. And if they sustain the current level of destruction and damage that is taking place all over the Gaza Strip to the point where it can literally no longer sustain life, you may end up in a situation in which to literally save the lives of people who are currently in Gaza, that you end up forcing them to basically leave in order to set up a quote-unquote temporary living situation elsewhere and then prevent them from returning. Stephanie, you talked about context before, getting at some of the root causes uh, that got us to October 7th, that created these conditions. Uh, other people have done that, and they haven't gotten a great response. I mean, the Israeli government was furious after UN uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that uh, the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating op occupation, with some Israeli officials actually accusing Guterres of defending Hamas. Activists expressing solidarity with Palestinians have similarly been accused of defending Hamas, despite the fact that only a small minority have actually uh, voiced support for the group. And many, including your group, have been accused of having a pro-Hamas sentiment uh, for asking to consider Again, the system of violence, to borrow your words, uh, that led us to October 7th. What's happening here? How are these messages somehow being conflated with support for Hamas? You know, it's critical that we understand that for Palestinians, October 6th, October 5th, October 4th, and every day for the last 75 years have been a day of great emergency and violence. That in the time, even just in this past year, between January 1st and October 7th, Israel had killed 250 Palestinians, including nearly 50 children. Pogroms were so frequent in the West Bank that we as an organization were having a hard time responding quickly enough. The Israeli military had bombed Janine refugee camp. Like we, you know, I've done this work for 15 years and I have never in my life been in a state of such emergency over the past year of just constant horrifying violence by the Israeli state, by the Israeli military, by settlers working locked in lockstep with those forces to attack or oppress and violently um, harm and kill Palestinians. And so it's outrageous to, to suggest that the mere mention of those causes and the mere attempt to uh, end violence is in fact somehow um, anti-Semitic or somehow disregarding of our deep care for Jewish life. Omer, Israel's UN ambassador, uh, Gilad Erdan, has repeatedly worn a yellow star of David like those that Jews were forced to wear during the Holocaust. He's worn them to meetings at the UN Security Council. Uh, but many say that comparing modern-day Israel with the plight of Jews in Nazi Germany is actually a false analogy. How do you make sense of those kind of competing narratives? Well, you know, shortly before uh, the Hamas attack, uh, there was a pogrom. And that pogrom was in Huara, in, uh, in a Palestinian town in the West Bank. And it more or less was according to how you define a pogrom. That is, that there is a mob that attacks a minority population in a, in a, in a certain territory. And this is what happened in the late 19th century and early 20th century to Jewish communities in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, then when the Hamas attack happened, 
then much of the Israeli media called that a pogrom. Uh, and that was meant really to evoke those memories and to say, well, you see now, uh, we are experiencing what we have always experienced. It's anti-Semitic. It's an anti-Semitic attack, and there's nothing you can do against anti-Semitism but to fight it. The, you can't talk with anti-Semites. Now, of course, it was not a pogrom, because a pogrom is an attack on a minority. And in this case, the, the whole point of Zionism, the whole point of creating a Jewish state was in response to pogroms, so the Jews would have as Zionism, as Zionism saw it, a Jewish majority state where the army would be Jewish, the police would be Jewish, the government would be Jewish, and therefore there would not be any pogroms. So calling the the, the attack of Hamas, which was an atrocious terrorist attack, uh, a pogrom is basically flipping things around. Uh, it's like calling 9-11 a pogrom. It was a terrorist attack, not a pogrom. The same thing happens with genocide. I mean, I've heard people claiming that the, that the Hamas attack was a genocide, and now um, many people marching uh, in many cities saying that there's a genocide in Gaza. There have been genocidal statements showing intent, and when you define genocide, you have to uh, show an intent to destroy a group as such. So intent has actually been shown uh, through these statements. Whether that is actually happening on the ground, that is whether there is intentional targeting of civilian population rather than indiscriminate bombing that brings about the killing of large numbers of people, of civilians, of innocent civilians, uh, that it, it has to be debated. I'm not sure that is the case. As I said, I think clearly there are war crimes happening, potentially crimes against humanity, whether it rises to the definition of genocide, I'm not sure. But I don't think in that sense it matters a great deal. Omar. Look, at least we agree that genocidal intent has been expressed. Now let's look at the actions and what they actually show. You have a situation in which Amnesty International put out a report saying that entire families are being wiped out, entire bloodlines. Multiple generations of the same family have been obliterated off the face of the earth. And when you look at the history of how many children are killed in different conflicts, you look at what happened in Ukraine, about five, just under 500 children were killed in Ukraine in the entire first year of Russia's war in Ukraine. And what everybody acknowledges included war crimes and massive indiscriminate bombing of, of Ukrainian areas. And when you look at what's happening in Gaza, 136 children are being killed every single day. You are looking at a ratio of more than 100 to 1 compared to almost any conflict that has happened in recent memory. Those numbers are absolutely horrifying, and the extent to which half the housing units in all of Gaza have been either completely destroyed or damaged, you are looking at a scale of destruction that, if it is not stopped, will make Gaza unfit for human living. So the question for me is whether you call this a genocide or not will depend on whether you stop it in time or not. However, it is absolutely genocidal violence that is currently taking place, that if it's allowed to continue, you are going to completely destroy Palestinians' ability to live in Gaza. Stephanie, uh, anti-Semitic attacks have risen in recent years, and since October 7th, we've seen uh, a number of disturbing assaults on Jewish people. Uh, there was a stabbing of a Jewish woman in, in Lyon. There was a Dagestan mob storming an airport in search of Jews. Uh, at the same time, many have characterized calls for a ceasefire as anti-Semitic and have accused Jewish organizations like uh, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, of being anti-Semitic. Um, in recent years, organizations around the world have adopted the IHRA's definition. That's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of uh, anti-Semitism, which deems speech yes. against the state of Israel as anti-Semitic. A Holocaust scholar, uh, Amos Goldberg, calls the IHRA definition catastrophic and says that the Israeli right has used it to completely change the discourse. I want to get your take on this also, Omer's. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's how we have this truly Orwellian world in which a march has happened this week that's supposing to be against anti-Semitism, but is actually a pro-war rally that is headlined by the, one of the most powerful anti-Semites in the U.S., 
Pastor John Hagee, who has said that God brought Hitler to punish Jews and to drive them into Israel and has been working for decades to bring about what he hopes will be a world-ending apocalyptic religious war in the land. You know, it's how we have Marjorie Taylor Greene of Jewish space laser fame, of all things, um, starting the ball rolling on what would become the shameful censure of our only Palestinian American member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, for fighting for the lives and rights of Palestinians and Israelis in equal measure. You know, so we have organizations like the Anti-Defamation League shutting down anti-apartheid student organizing in the name of Jewish safety is insane. You know, we see them actually collecting. They're understood as somehow to be the, the data collectors about anti-Semitism in the world, but using that IHRA definition and using their own um, slanderous definitions, they actually um, are collecting the, the incidents of the largest Jewish protests in decades that are here fighting for a ceasefire for peace, um, they're, they're documenting those as incidents of anti-Semitism. So we have this upside down funhouse mirror situation of intentional confusion about what anti-Semitism really is. And that is incredibly dangerous in a moment when white nationalism and, and, and um, anti-Semitic ideologies are, are driving violence against Jews and against Muslims and people of color. It's essential that we be clear on what anti-Semitism is and on what it's not, and that our movements are fighting for a future of, of freedom and safety for all people. And so, so Omar, Omar wanted to jump in. Let me, let me, I'm going to give you a chance to jump in, yeah, Omar. Just want to piggyback on one thing that Stephanie was saying that I think is really, really telling. Whenever Israel starts committing war crimes, there is also a rise in anti-Semitic attacks. And it is baffling that leading organizations, rather than distance themselves from these war crimes, insist that these war crimes are speaking in the name of the Jewish people. That is just lunacy. It tells you that they are less interested in combating anti-Semitism and they are more interested in running interference for promoting Israeli policy. Anti-Semitism is a very serious and rising problem in this country. And to play with it, these silly political games and to water down that charge by flinging it at people who are trying to defend human rights and stand up to war crimes, I think is, is incredibly dangerous. Omer? So, you know, two Israeli professors, uh, Amos Goldberg, whom you mentioned, and Aaron Confino, uh, and then myself joining them, um, actually uh, responded to the IRA definition that has been um, used by the Israeli government, um, creating a separate definition, the, the, Jer the Jerusalem Declaration on, on anti-Semitism, that removes those sections that try to say that any uh, criticism of the state of Israel is anti-Semitic. But the IRA definition has been successful in being adopted by many governments, um, in, including quite a number of European governments, and it is a weaponization by the Israeli government of anti-Semitism in order to uh, defend itself from any criticism of its own policies. You know, I'm a historian, so what I find most ironic about it is that the state of Israel was created as a response to anti-Semitism. It was supposed to be the state in which Jews would be protected from anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic attacks on Jews uh, would, would no longer have any rationale to them. And the result right now is that just as Israel right now is the most dangerous place for Jews in the world, it's also the, the, the main cause now for anti-Semitic attacks. Nobody should condone those anti-Semitic attacks. But I think, as Omar was saying, uh, when a state behaves in a particular way and it declares itself to be the state of the Jews, then this has a particular effect on Jewish communities around the world. You could say that what most triggers right now uh, anti-Semitism around the world is the conduct of the state of Israel itself. Stephanie, we've seen Jewish organizations at the forefront of the ceasefire movement. Are we seeing a growing diversity of opinion uh, within the Jewish community when it comes to Israel? I mean, absolutely. The, the you know, protest movement of the last month speaks for itself. We have thousands and thousands of Jews of all ages, certainly young people, of course, but of all ages pouring into the streets where, you know, the movement um, for Palestinian rights and freedom, Jews have always been a part of. We're, and also, we've always been a part of so many movements for, for justice and freedom. And we bring all of that history with us into this moment in which it feels like... Um, 
everything we've learned, everything we've um, fought for all of our lives must be brought to bear to end these historic atrocities that we're seeing. All right, that's all we have time for. I want to thank you all for joining me. Omer, Stephanie, Omar, thank you so much for joining me. It's great having a conversation with you, everybody. That is our show up front. We'll be back next week.